Greetings, and welcome to the Bowling Green First United Methodist Church. We hope that you enjoy what you're about to see, and you can find us on the corner of Broadway and Church Streets at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Or you can find us at bgmethodist.org and on Facebook at Bowling Green First United Methodist Church. Now we are uh, this morning going to... Uh, I want to start this morning with a, a couple of uh, some iconic video moments that have been captured on video over the last uh, you know, 50, 60, 80 years, somewhere around there, that, uh, that kind of, uh, in, in different ways, have kind of shaped our thinking. And so the first one is one that many of you will remember, some of you all better than some of the rest of us, uh, but it's a, uh, a clip that is gets used on a regular basis, we see all the time because of the power behind the words. It comes from uh, President Kennedy uh, back during his time in office. Oh. Hold on. See, you know, this is, this is great. It works fine in the morning when I get here, and then all of a sudden it decides not to, uh, to switch back over. Because this is far more complicated than you're willing to make this out to be. 
And so there was one, uh, one of those iconic moments that is captured on video. Another is I first saw this when I was in uh, probably high school, I think. I kept thinking junior high, but I think it was in high school. Uh, and you all will probably recognize this one also. I bring a message from your master, Marcus Licinius Crossus, commander of Italy, by command of his most merciful excellency. Your lives are to be spared. Slaves you were, and slaves you remain. But the terrible penalty of crucifixion has been set aside on the single condition that you identify the body or the living person of the slave called Spartacus. I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! that are fundamental to who we are, that our 
fundamental to us being able to, to move forward in this life, for us being able to uh, connect change in the world around us. And all of these things are an important part of our statement of faith. But they're an important part because they, in the Apostles' Creed and also uh, the Nicene Creed, a life improvement the other night, we, we were looking at the Nicene Creed, and, and it goes into even more detail. All of these statements that are being made are necessary because they are some of the first places where we are clearly stating just who Jesus is. Just what it is that he, that he is doing. Because we have other places in Scripture where we talk about this, but now we have some place where it is laid out. But it's a little bit harder for us to understand. But it's important that we do so because it's on Jesus that in the Christian faith we pivot on that. That's what, it, what centers us, is the person and the presence of Jesus Christ. And in the early church, they felt it was necessary to make these things clear because they were dealing with heresies inside the church. Lots and lots of different heresies. And, and the vast majority of them centered on who Jesus is. On all of these things that were, uh, that in many ways were unbelievable, that could, they could exist together. And so they were having to make statements saying, this is what we believe. This is what we know to be true. And the heresies, those things that were outside of the mainstream, that weren't part of what the majority believed and found to be true, but even more so than that, they were seen and by the folks of their time that if it was a heresy, it was detrimental to your immortal soul because it was taking you away from the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus Christ. And so they were saying, this is what we have to say in order so folks know what is true and what is right and what is good. And so we see this work that Jesus is doing. And one of the first things that comes out is this. Uh, from verse 14 out of our reading in John this morning, The Word became flesh and made His home among us. We have seen His glory, glory like that of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Now this is one of those places where we have to be careful uh, not to be a jelly donut. Uh, because... This is one of those places where we say, Jesus being a human and divine, and that's really strange to us, and so that's outside of our realm of understanding, but for folks at that time, they would have been okay with that. They would have understood it, because they had this whole uh, hierarchy of gods that was, that was established. At the top was a, uh, was a supreme being. Uh, some folks said that it was like Zeus or Jupiter from the Greek and Roman pantheon of gods. Uh, some of the other philosophers, like Plato and others, said, no, there's a... A supreme being even above those guys, and that's at the very top of that. And then you move your way down to the less powerful until you get to the very bottom, and there are the divine humans. Uh, these are folks like uh, the Roman emperors were particularly good at either declaring themselves to be God or getting others to declare them that they were that they were divine or a god in some way. Uh, that's where they were. So folks in Jesus' time would have been used to this kind of, this was not something that was unusual to them. They said, oh, we know this. The twist with Jesus is that normally the, the way this worked is you would go from being human to divine, and Jesus starts at divine and becomes human, and that is what makes all the difference. Jesus was using an existing structure that they understood and that they knew, but was twisting it, was, was uh, interpreting it differently because he bent all the rules for what they knew to be true. They understood what it meant for a human to be, to be God. But what does it mean for God to become human? That was what made all the difference. Because this is what was going to change things. Because of what Jesus was doing in this way. Jesus was Lord to his followers. Now, we think that's a, you know, we have no problems with that because we call Jesus Lord all the time. That is, that is just, that's a natural part of who we are. We don't think anything of it. At that time, though, at a time where you had a narcissistic, uh, you know, emperor who has, uh, who had uh, godlike tendencies, uh, or godlike beliefs about himself, if you were to call someone else Lord, you were asking for trouble. Uh, you were just itching for a fight. You were itching for the entire Roman army to come down on you because you didn't do that. The only person you called Lord was the emperor. That was how that worked. You called someone else Lord, and they looked around and they, and they said, "Well, why aren't you worshiping the emperor?" And he said, "He may, you know, he may be, he may think this about himself, but I know the Lord, and he is more." 
more than the emperor ever thought about being. There was a reason why the authorities were afraid of Christians. It wasn't because they had bigger armies or they were stronger, but it was because of where they placed their faith and their allegiance in someone that was above their emperor. You couldn't hurt them. For all that they tried from the end of the first century through the beginning of the fourth century, and they tried to persecute the Christians, it kept happening, but the Christians kept coming back because they had that faith. Faith one level, you know, well, more than one level, but faith higher than in just the emperor or any of these other gods that were supposed to be effective. And their faith, not only was it in a different place, but it was in a different way. Because folks in that time, their, their idea of faith was not like ours. Uh, their idea of faith was that they said, well, <clears throat> you didn't have to have faith in a particular God. This is how they could have so many of them and they wouldn't come into conflict. You didn't have to have faith in a particular God. What you did was, if you, you, know, you wanted a blessing for the birth of a child, or you needed rain for a field, or you wanted, you know, whatever it was that you wanted or desired or didn't want to happen, you said, you kind of went through your list and went, ah, that one. I'll go with that God. That means I have to offer this sacrifice, or this gift, or this thing. And if I do that, then this, what I want, is supposed to happen. It was a transaction. They would put that together, they would make that happen. Uh, and that was the extent of their faith. And if it didn't happen, that meant that your sacrifice wasn't big enough. That you needed to do more. Uh, and Jesus comes along and says, that's not how this works, y'all. That's a really kind of a very shallow kind of faith. If all you have to do is make the appropriate payment and then that happens, that really isn't a good faith at all. That doesn't do anything. Jesus says that this kind of transactional relationship between God and man just doesn't work. But again, Jesus is tearing apart the fabric of their society at the time and re and putting it back together in a brand new way. And it was hard for people to accept when this is what you were used to. In fact, today, we're going to talk about this more next week, we still have this same problem even today with, our under, with a lot of times the way we talk about it, we understand that our faith is a transaction from one to the other. And it's because Jesus was doing something different. He had to come and be human here on earth. Because remember this part. The end of our reading out of chapter 1 this morning. No one has ever seen God. God the only Son who is at the Father's side has made God known. Remember last week we were talking about God as, as a Father Almighty and Creator of heaven and earth. You know, we said that part of the problem was that God looked down and saw that uh, through all the things that were going on in the world, we were growing farther and farther and farther away from God. Uh, and remember, it's hard for us to, to look on, remember the Old Testament says, you know, you never saw God's face because it's like, you know, it's like looking into the sun without any sunglasses on. It's hurt, only it's even worse. There's too much, there's too great a power difference between those two. But God still loves us. And he said, this is unacceptable. We will make this work. And so he sends another part of himself to come into the world in a way that we would understand. Which also meant that he had to become fully human so we could interact, so we could talk, so we could be with, so we could, so we could share our lives with that person, with that part of God. And so he sends Jesus into the world to bridge that gap between us and God so that we can so that God can be made known to us. So that we can have that relationship. So we can overcome this gap that's there. Not because through our power, but because of what Christ does. This is the Christ that God sends. The one who doesn't seek out power, but seeks out people. Because he's got all the power that he needs. What he is looking for is the people. Wanting the people, wanting us to be known to God. Or more importantly for us to know so he comes to seek us out. As we go from here today, we remember that the way Jesus does all of this, he does this as a natural part of himself. But he does this because he uses established structures, but uses them in different ways so that we are, so that we see things, so we see the world differently and in a new way. That uh, he helped that he works to subvert the established norms of our time in such a way that we build something new, but he also, because his big concern is that we come and we are known, as cliche as it sounds, so that he knows our name. That is the place to come. As we go 
go from here today, we go, let's go into a world where we can share that hope and that promise of a God who seeks us out for no other reason than out of his love for us and wanting us to know him and, and for us to know that he already knows who we are. Let us go and share that gospel with the world around us. In Jesus' name.